and great pleasure to welcome you all here for this opening press conference related to the annual meeting, to the, our 48th annual meeting, the annual meeting 2018. I ask myself sometimes the questions, why is Davos so attractive? And I think your participation here is a demonstration that Davos seems to be attractive. Is it just because it brings interesting people together? Or is there something more behind it? The World Economic Forum as the international organization for public-private cooperation and the annual meeting of all our communities clearly correspond or respond to a true need of a multipolar, multi-stakeholder, multi-conceptual, interdependent, complex, and fast-moving world. It's a response to a need. And I will share with you, at the outset of this meeting, seven reasons why such a response to a new world is appropriate. First, governments, business, civil society cannot address alone the multifold challenges we have on the global agenda. We need collaborative efforts. And Davos has become the annual most representative high-level multi-stakeholder summit. We have quotas for each stakeholder groups, and we distinguish, in principle, six different stakeholder groups participating in Davos. First, of course, you have governments and business, governments and international organizations, with over 300 participants. You have the business community, you have civil society, and I want to underline the participation of the civil society. You see the names in your material. But then the discussions have also to be enriched by the best expertise. Therefore, we invite universities, experts, academia. Very important, and that's the fifth group, is the young generation. In Davos, we have a great contingent, a very active contingent of young global leaders and of our community of global shapers. And finally, of course, you have you, uh, the media. So it's the second reason for the significance of Davos. Today, no global industry or regional issue can be solved in an isolated way. We need a systemic approach. We need an ecosystem. And you see in your material, the World Economic Forum has defined 14 different systems which form a substantial part of the program in Davos. It's not just the plenary sessions, which certainly will uh, be um, very much attended by you and reported about. For us, what is key are the 400 different working sessions. You could say Davos is a gigantic workshop. That's, by the way, also the reason why governments do not just send the head of state or the head of governments as a head of governments, but uh, you will see certain governments have eight to ten ministers in Davos to participate in all those different uh, sessions. As you have seen, the theme, which is actually more a motto, this year is creating a shared future in a fractured world. 
I don't want to develop more on the theme, but I want to draw your attention to the draft of my opening speech, which you also find in your papers. And by the way, in the opening speech, I will call for what I would define as qualitative easing. I remember 10 years ago when the uh, financial crisis broke out, in my opening speech I said, this financial crisis will be followed by an economic crisis and afterwards by a social crisis. We are moving out of the financial and economic crisis, but we are still stuck in a social crisis, which requires what I call qualitative easing. The third reason for the relevance of Davos, it's not a standalone meeting. See, all the sessions, the agenda are embedded into an ongoing workflow with numerous preparatory and follow-up activities. I just want to demonstrate this effect by our Middle East Summit, uh, which we had last year, which acted as a preparation for what we are doing related to the Middle East this year. And you will see we have most of the leaders of the Middle East joining us in Davos. But I would like to mention also our Sustainable Development Impact Summit, where we made during the UN General Assembly Week some progress on specific issues related to the SDGs. In Davos, the forum itself, we launched three initiatives, a global network of centers for the fourth industrial revolution, a global center for cybersecurity, and AppLinked, which is the world's foremost innovation accelerator. Let me add a fifth reason for the relevance of Davos. The timing of the annual meeting at the beginning of each year is very important. It allows to focus and to highlight the priorities for the year. If you look at 2018, this year will be decisive for Europe. And therefore, we are pleased to have most or practically all European leaders coming to Davos. I just mentioned President Macron of France, Prime Minister Gentiloni of Italy, Prime Minister May, the President of the European Commission, um, Mr. Juncker, uh, the King Felipe of Spain, the President and the Prime Minister of Poland, and I could go on and enumerate here practically the leaders of all 27 or 28 uh, countries. A second big issue in Davos will certainly be the future of global cooperation related to trade, environment, fight against terrorism, tax systems, competitiveness, and in this context, it's absolutely essential to have President Trump with us. Another issue certainly discussed in Davos is the future of economic growth. We are possibly at the end of an economic upswing cycle, and the future of economic development, particularly also with, uh, uh, related to the policies of central banks next year, will be a big discussion issue. I should also mention that Davos is a place where the G20 agenda and the G7 agenda is prepared. G20 agenda with the presence of President Macri, G7 agenda with the presence of um, uh, Prime Minister Trudeau. I draw your attention to the publication of the Global Risk Report, which will be, um, it will be done tomorrow, uh, tomorrow morning. And the Global Risk Report is for us a kind of uh, directive. What are really the key issues in uh, 2018? 
Another, let's say, special feature of Davos is that it is a mirror of a multipolar world reflecting the rising and promising power. And in this respect, I'm happy to say that now more than one third of the participants come from developing countries or emerging countries. And here of, part of, of relevance is the fact that the uh, uh, Prime Minister Modi is the opening speaker on Tuesday, the 23rd of January. And he represents, as you know, the biggest democracy in the world and the fastest growing economy, thanks to bold um, reforms, uh, the fastest growing economy uh, of the G20 countries. We are also fortunate to following the visit of President Xi last year, where he made a historical speech to welcome Liu He, a member of the political bureau of the CPC Central Committee and the head of the Central Leading Group for Financial and Economic Affairs, which reports directly to President Xi. But we also welcome in Davos newcomers. I just want to mention President Laurentio from Angola for the first time in Davos, President, uh, the President of Zimbabwe, or the newly elected President of the ANC in South Africa, uh, Ramaphosa. What is important for us, and I add an additional feature, is the integration of all those discussions into the context of the Fourth Industrial Revolution. The Fourth Industrial Revolution, which I conceptualized in the book two years ago, will not only change business models, but will deeply transform our economic, political, and social systems. So it's very important to um, use the knowledge which the Forum has um, accumulated uh, to provide a context for our also political and for our economic discussions. And um, I have the pleasure to show you a book which just comes out this week, uh, which I wrote together with uh, colleagues. Uh, it's Shaping the Fourth Industrial Revolution. The first book was an analysis, but now we really have to shape the Fourth Industrial Revolution. So let me just uh, conclude by summarizing in an intertwined, interdependent, fast-moving world where traditional ways and organizations have difficulties to cope with the change, Davos should provide three particular features. First, a collaborative approach. Nobody today, no country alone, no stakeholder group alone, no individual alone can solve the issues on the global agenda. Second, an integrated approach. No issue can be solved in an isolated way. And finally, a constructive approach. We are living at an inflection point with many opportunities, great opportunities, but also confronting, like never before, perils. There is today a real danger of a collapse of our global systems. But change is not just happening. It is in our hands to improve the state of the world, and that's what the World Economic Forum stands for. Thank you. Ladies and gentlemen, thanks to our executive chairman, Professor Klaus Schwab, for that introduction to this 2018 annual meeting. Uh, my name is Adrian Monk. I am head of public and social engagement here at the Forum. And I'll just be with my colleagues introducing you to some of the 
themes and diving a little bit deeper into uh, the sessions and uh, the characters outlined by Professor Schwab in his opening remarks. Uh, and I'm going to start by turning to my uh, quite new com uh, colleague, uh, been with us a, a couple of months now, uh, our president, Borger Brenda, just to speak a little bit to that public figure representation in uh, what is an action-packed annual meeting. Borger. Thank you, Adrian, and good afternoon to all of you. Um, why do we have unprecedented participation of uh, public figures this year? 70 head of states and governments, uh, 340 ministers, deputy uh, prime ministers, etc. Part of that answer is that uh, the world at the start of 2018 are faced with some real systemic challenges. If we are not able to deal with them, that can even challenge our planet's capacity um, to deal with these challenges moving forward. What we know is that what we lack is cooperation that is necessary to address these challenges. Look, for example, at economic growth. Economic growth is back, but it is not as inclusive as it should be. It doesn't create all the jobs we want, and it also has to stick to um, the planet's capacity. It has to be sustainable. Only if world leaders come together, government leaders, business leaders, but also civil society in a multi-stakeholder way, I think we can then become uh, really um, the, um, we can find the solutions that are needed. Look also at, for example, climate change. We had the coldest days in a long time in the east coast of the US and some of the hottest ones in Sydney. How can we make sure that mitigating CO2 emissions doesn't hurt our capacity to also contribute with electricity to the 1.2 billion people in the world that lacks access to electricity. These challenges can only be dealt with in a collaborative way, multi-stakeholder way, and then I think also this is what governmental leaders feel, that coming to Davos, you can really have the right conversations and also you can then be catalytic in the sense of new initiatives to address these challenges. And if you look then uh, also at um, uh, the geopolitical aspect, we have representation this year uh, that um, is very strong regionally. In a, multi in a multipolar world, uh, of course, the regions are also increasingly important. Africa, we have 10 head of states and governments from Africa. They're coming to Davos to discuss the Horn of Africa. We have a special diplomatic session there with the Prime Minister of Somalia, Prime Minister of Ethiopia, and also the key other leaders from Africa. We have a special session on peace and reconciliation in Africa, where we have Peter Maurer, uh, the head of ICRC, also facilitating this, because we know that where there is conflict, there is no development, and we know that from the MDGs, none of the Millennium Development Goals were met in those countries that were facing war and conflict. So there's a huge peace dividend, and also business can play a constructive role in this. Moving to the Middle East, we have nine head of states and governments from the Middle East. We will have a special diplomatic session on Syria, moderated by Stefan de Mistura, the special envoy of the UN Secretary General on Syria. We will on Friday continue our work on the Israeli-Palestinian issue, having uh, the Israeli business and Palestinian business community coming together and putting pressure on their leaders to find solutions. Uh, it's very interesting that the business community uh, plays uh, this role. And also, as uh, Professor Schwab mentioned, we will practically have a European summit 
in Davos. We will have more than 40 head of states and governments coming from Europe and Eurasia. And um, Europe is now uh, in a situation where we see that growth is back. There's still a lot of pressing issues. And one of them is the West Balkans. We will have a special diplomatic session this year on the situation in the West Balkans. And we have all the leaders, all the head of state governments from West Balkans sitting together with the EU leadership discussing this. This is really contributing to also a more stable Europe in the future. Other pressing issues that we are facing are also in Latin America. We have unprecedented participation from Latin America, six head of states and governments. And one of the topics will, of course, be Venezuela, where the president of the Dominican Republic, that is the interlocutor on the Venezuela crisis, will be there, also with former Prime Minister Zapatero. This is also working on the peace and reconciliation there to address this. Moving to Asia, we will have a session on the Korean uh, Peninsula, where we will have Under Secretary General of the UN, Jeff Feldman, that just came back from Pyongyang um, on the request of the government there and also the Secretary General. Um, this will be discussed in a multi stakeholder way. And on the international organizations, we will have close to 40 international organizations in Davos. Um, and all the Bretton Woods heads and also the Secretary General uh, Antonio uh, Guterres. So we will begin uh, with Prime Minister Modi um, heading the largest democracy in the world. And we will end then with President Trump heading the largest economy of the world, the US, 25% of the global GDP. But I'm so pleased that we also see the emerging economies, developing countries there, and uh, participating in Davos in a true multi-stakeholder uh, way, and getting all the relevant actors together at the beginning of the year to try to address and solve some of the systemic challenges that we are facing. Borga, thank you very much. Um, and that participation, as you outlined, it will be framed in some 400 plus sessions. And the person who is responsible with her team for helping design those sessions is with me now, Emma. Uh, Emma, can you just tell us a little bit about how you construct this program and how you engage all these participants in these four days of activity? Thank you. Thanks, Adrian. Hello. Um, Yes, I'll take you a little bit behind the scenes of the annual meeting and also um, highlight a couple of the inspiring people that we've been working with and that will be engaging in the conversations next week. And also just end with a couple of personal highlights in the program this year. The five day program um, comprises over 400 sessions and in terms of each session, we really think about the, the intention behind each. And the goal of our team is really to look at ways in which we can change mindsets, that we can help bring fresh perspectives and diverse perspectives into the conversations, but also facilitate the kind of interaction that can lead to real impact. And we don't design the annual meeting in isolation, in fact, uh, we work with um, many, many different groups, our communities, our stakeholders in consultation year round. We draw on many of the projects and the initiatives that are also led by the forum with the different stakeholders. And even this year, we've even gone into the classroom of a, of a school in Davos to work with teachers and students to come up with ideas, particularly for our open forum program which is um, part of the program that really is access and has full access to the global public as well. And um, really, the complexity of such a program is also comes with a huge responsibility. And I often think of, of this as very similar to sort of the inner workings of a, of a Swiss watch where everything needs to work seamlessly together, but also in synchronization. Uh, so the right people, the right topic, but also in the right way, so that we create the kind of conditions that can really lead to, lead to change. Um, we've heard that we have 3,000 participants in Davos, and I thought it would be helpful just, just to highlight a few of these. We have seven co-chairs um, who've been selected for their outstanding leadership uh, from the public and private sector. For example, we have Prime Minister of Norway, Erna Solberg, 
we have the Managing Director of the IMF, Christine Lagarde, and also the Secretary General of CERN, one of the leading uh, sort of world's research uh, institutes and scientific research centers just across the lake here, Fabiola Giannotti. We also have 12 Nobel laureates coming to Davos this year. Uh, from economics, from science, but also representatives of Peace Prize as well. And here we're delighted to have uh, been working with and will, will be joining us for the first time is the uh, education and girls education activist Malala and also the child labor activist Kailash Satyati. And they'll be joining conversations around gender equality, but also modern slavery, just a few of the topics we'll be addressing in the program. We also have uh, with us and have been working with uh, artists and cultural leaders. And why? Because these are the individuals that can help to sort of speak truth to power, but also help to uh, challenge and inspire those around them. And this year, as is tradition now, on Monday evening we'll open with our Crystal Awards. These are awards that are given to leading artists from around the world who are committed to real change. And this year we'll be awarding the actor and producer Kate Blanchett for her work in helping to raise awareness around the refugee crisis. We are also awarding the solo musical artist Sir Elton John for his work in fighting against HIV AIDS and the Bollywood actor Shah Rukh Khan for his work on really championing both children and women's rights in India. So this just gives you a glimpse into the kind of people that are joining us and uh, why this matters is because everyone that comes to Davos really brings both the experience and the expertise that's absolutely critical to helping to ensure good governance of society. And I'll just end with a couple of personal highlights. I said we have over 400 program um, sessions and workshops. So choosing the ones I wanted to highlight today has been, been really, really difficult. But if I were to mention a few, I think the Tuesday afternoon uh, with all seven co-chairs speaking to their vision, but also their call for sh creating a shared future in a fractured world. And then as we go into Wednesday and Thursday in the program and start to deep dive into specific issues, we will see Malala, Prime Minister Trudeau of Canada and Fabiola Giannotti of CERN, uh, really mobilizing action around what it will take to realize our human and economic potential through education and empowerment. And then ending the meeting, we have a wonderful lineup of real agents of change in um, different artists and cultural leaders, photographer Platon, uh, the um, award-winning film uh, maker Lynette Walworth, as well as Iranian artist Mehdi Ganlanyu and the Chinese choreographer Xinxing. And I just want to highlight as well, we don't just think about what goes on behind the four walls of each of the session rooms. We have also created numerous exhibitions, installations, simulations, working with the Smithsonian Institution, also with the uh, Science Gallery International, as well as NGO Crossroads Foundation. And these are experiences that we hope will provoke meaningful dialogue. And just one example is where we will be connecting live to different locations around the world to create a, a dialogue and a two-way exchange in places like Gaza, Mexico City, Colorado, uh, even Herat and other places where there'll be a two-way dialogue um, with people that will talk about trust, uh, community, technology and other important topics. And this is just one way that I think we're really creating real impact. So I'll end there, but um, really encourage you to read the full program. I know you've all got a copy, um, 400 sessions, but there are, uh, are many that, that really will make a difference. And I encourage you also to join uh, online. We have over 130 sessions online and live and join the conversation via social media as well. Thank you. Emma, thank you. Um, obviously, a big part of Davos is our business participation. And Cheryl Martin, I'm going to turn to you and ask you to tell us a little bit more about uh, that participation and which companies will be represented. Absolutely. Thanks, Adrian. Uh, thank you, everyone. Um, 
Emma and Borgay have already framed what is going to be a very dynamic and exciting meeting. But as we look at bringing it truly to life, we have to look at what's the breadth and depth of the business engagement that's going to be happening across this week. And I'd like to highlight for you three things to help you not only appreciate the annual meeting, but the ongoing and through the year engagement of the companies from around the world. First, I'll talk a little bit about a couple projects that have um, been making significant traction since last year's annual meeting. Give you a little bit of the detail about who are these business leaders who are going to be here in Davos. And close with just a couple of highlights about some things I'm particularly excited about that we're going to be advancing during the meeting next week. And so let me start with just um, something that I think everyone can identify as really important. Last year at Davos, we announced the Coalition for Epidemic Preparedness Innovation. A, a group of uh, several countries coming together with the Gates Foundation, Wellcome Trust, and throughout this year, almost every company in the vaccine supply chain to say, what and how do we have to do things differently so we in the globe can respond to the un unknown of where, but certainly it will happen, epidemic threats that we will face. And since the coalition has launched, they've already launched two separate initiatives call for action and funding of, of vaccine development already in that first year. Certainly a way that we're seeing, seeing big difference. Another effort that launched last year in Davos was the Hydrogen Coalition. Through this year, it's developed to be 18 different companies coming together across the hydrogen ecosystem. At COP23, they highlighted a roadmap that actually looked to 2050 and identified significant investment but also millions of jobs and the ability to potentially address 25% of the emissions reduction needed. Now, if that's not something that's exciting and only happens because you bring together the public and the private sector in these conversations, then I don't know what is. In addition, though, we have other conversations around energy, like the Oil and Gas Climate Initiative, which was launched on the Forums platform several years ago, bringing out its first investments. And in addition, work on grid transformation and electrification that has moved from last year a global set of learnings and best practices to actual implementation with policy in, this, in the uh, country of Colombia this year. And so you can see not only the richness of individual efforts, but how they come together to really start to have a systemic conversation. And the business is at the center of that. And so who do we have coming to Davos? Um, you know, I think two of the people we should highlight immediately are two of our business co-chairs. Isabel Coker, the CEO of the Angie Group uh, in energy, certainly, and then Ginny Romney of IBM, both of whom absolutely passionate. We're going to hear them on Tuesday with the rest of the co-chairs share their vision about a fractured world and what we're going to do about it. But in addition, we have almost 1,900 other business leaders globally about a third of them from each Europe, North America, and the rest of the world. Many, many CEOs and C-suite executives, but not just from the global companies, from the startup and the technology enabling community, as well as some of our own global leaders. And so we're very, very excited about these leaders coming together. And as Professor Schwab said, coming to one of the biggest, largest workshops that they could possibly imagine to get, engage at the most senior levels in these conversations. And so let me close with the two examples of some things that I also think are thought provoking as we think about moving things forward. Just very recently, we launched another one of our health efforts on value-based healthcare. In partnership with the city of Atlanta, 40 organizations came together for a five-year pilot on cardiac, um, cardiac heart failure with a goal of having, in 10 years, 30,000 lives saved because we're focused on the patient and not just on the treatment. If we can have that type of effort, and in Davos we'll be having a conversation about how do we roll this out further in things like diabetes with Canada, how do we move this in coronary heart disease with Singapore, and in other discussions um, with countries like the Netherlands. And so continuing to move these impactful multi-stakeholder efforts forward in ways that re-envision how and why we think about healthcare. And last but not least, I think our efforts in um, promoting global financial inclusion 
Um, while we've had this effort for multiple years, I think we're seeing very significant traction looking at how and why these technologies of the fourth industrial revolution enable us to think about digital enablement of financial inclusion. But it's not just the finance companies coming together. It's finance companies and the telecoms companies and consumer companies with the um, governments and the NGOs and academics in order to have a multi-stakeholder dialogue about what has to be advanced. This past year, we saw great traction, again in Colombia, with actually legislative action in these areas and some really interesting pilots in Mexico. And as we come through and into 2018, through Davos and into 2018, looking at East Africa, where we move in work in Rwanda uh, to Tanzania and Kenya with their central banks. So again, this business-driven, business multi-stakeholder engagement in order to really impact people's lives and truly make a difference. And so I could clearly go on. I clearly have no enthusiasm about this subject, uh, but I will happily turn over to uh, my colleague, Sadia, uh, to talk a little bit more about um, some equally, uh, areas equally of interest to business on um, skills and technology and economic growth. So Adrian, thank you. Thank you. And Sadia, that's your cue. Uh, I know you engage with civil society and also tell us a little bit more about the social issues, which are a big part of the Davos agenda this year. Professor Schwab referred to the recovery since the financial crisis and also pointed to a social crisis that is starting to unfold. Uh, any growth for it to be meaningful um, has to be inclusive. Next week, we'll be launching our Inclusive Development Index that points to how countries are performing on inclusion, on intergenerational equity, uh, and on uh, sustainability. Uh, unsurprisingly, we find that while growth is recovering, there are still major challenges when it comes to equity uh, and, and inclusion across both rich economies and poor economies. So what are we trying to do to help solve that problem? And this is something that we're not doing just at Davos, but really working year round and Davos becomes one moment in which uh, some of these stakeholders are able to come together. Let me give you three examples. Uh, one, we will be producing next week um, for public view job transition maps. So a truck driver who is being displaced in their current role, what are the opportunities for that person to reskill and move towards a new job? What are the opportunities for an administrative assistant? What are the opportunities for a customer service worker? This will be laid out in this large big data exercise we've been doing over the last few months. Second, how do we translate that knowledge into real tangible action? That is where we're working with coalitions of businesses, as Cheryl mentioned, to try to do some of that reskilling and upskilling that's required in the workforce so that people are ready for those new opportunities. We'll be announcing um, that a coalition of just 25 companies at this stage um, are making an announcement to reskill 10 million people by 2020, 2 million of which has already been achieved and we'll be sharing more on that next week. And one core industry as a part of that is the IT industry, which has put together a portal with their digital skills and trainings, which is aiming for reskilling 1 million people as a part of that 10 million uh, group that will be targeted. Uh, the third example uh, relates to diversity and gender equality. Uh, I think we, we all know that some of these opportunities for fulfilling your potential are often missing for women due to outdated norms and structures. We're working uh, in a public-private collaboration exercise with the Inter-American Development Bank in three countries in Latin America already, and we'll be announcing a fourth and uh, announcing up to 10 by the end of 2018 uh, to accelerate gender equality, particularly in the context of the fourth industrial revolution and the new opportunities it's offering. Finally, none of these efforts um, could move forward without the engagement of civil society, without the unions that represent the world's workers, the NGOs that support and provide relief to some of the most disadvantaged communities in the world, the social entrepreneurs that provide new opportunities to many, many communities around the world, and the religious leaders that represent the different identities and values of people in different communities um, around the world. We're very pleased that 140 civil society leaders will be joining us, including two of the co-chairs, Sharon Burrow, representing uh, the world's workers, and Chetna Sinha, who is representing women entrepreneurs. Thanks. Sadia, thank you very much. And uh, last thing, I'm going to turn to Dominic Waray, who heads our public-private partnerships. 
Uh, we are the Organisation for Public-Private Collaboration. So, Dominic, can you just tell us a little bit more about some of those highlights from the annual meeting programme? Yeah, thank you, Adrian. And you've heard already from our panel a number of um, excellent examples of where the public and private and civil society have come together and really tackled some systemic challenges. Um, it's surprising and interesting across the course of the year how many of these events and activities and workshops and uh, get-togethers that we do really create kind of interesting and important outcomes a couple more from the spring. We were delighted to help a number of governments and businesses launch a $400 million fund to kickstart investment for deforestation-free agriculture. We're working with an alliance of governments who represent 70, 70, 70% 70 of the world's greenhouse gas emissions to accelerate clean energy innovation across their economies, building on some of the comments that uh, Cheryl shared with you about the substantive interaction between business and government on some of these tricky issues. But above and beyond that, these platforms for shaping the future that Professor Schwab set out for instilling that sense of cooperation in the world that we live in. We had a very, very interesting and exciting year um, on these matters. We inaugurated our center for the fourth industrial revolution in San Francisco with its remit to maximize the benefits of science and technology for society. We're delighted that there are now eight projects up and running at that center involving governments and business and experts to really kind of figure out what are the safeguards that we need um, in global society to maximize the opportunities of things like artificial intelligence, things like precision medicine, um, and many other matters besides. We also had a very important development which Professor Schwab mentioned uh, to you in September at the time of the General Assembly of the United Nations. That was the first sustainable development impact summit. You've heard of these global goals of the UN and you've heard of the need for cooperation across the public and private. How to bring people together to accelerate and scale that delivery. That's exactly what two days of discussion with 700 participants, including civil society, NGO leaders, business people and heads of these international organizations worked on. There were some very, very interesting results. An $850 million fund supported by Denmark and other countries to invest in the global goals. A new alliance, the Global Battery Alliance, to bring together industry and other actors to deal with child labor, to deal with pollution, to deal with innovation, and to create clean energy solutions in this growing market of batteries we'll need to power the fourth industrial revolution. So a lot has been going on, and in fact, that makes uh, the annual meeting 2018, as you've heard, a very, very exciting milestone for us, particularly for these 14 system initiatives which have been mentioned, these platforms for cooperation between the public and private. Some highlights from the week ahead of us. Um, there are so many that it's impossible to draw everything to your attention and you, or paperwork and the website will have more. But there are three which I think are, are very exciting to us. We're going to be launching our new global center for cybersecurity, focused on capacity building, policy development and scenario planning to help protect us all from the risks of cyber uh, attack. Pensions, we've all got a pension in the room. Um, you'll have noticed during the year, I am sure, that we had a very, very interesting piece of work that detected a pension time bomb. The largest pension funds in the world um, are facing people who are living longer and saving less. If we don't act, there will be a $400 trillion gap between what is needed and what people will look for for their pensions by 2050. That's five times the size of the world economy. So bringing together right now leaders from the financial system, uh, from those involved in pensions and institution investors and governments to figure out what to do before this problem strikes. And then moving into other areas, we're delighted to um, look forward to launching a major new action agenda on oceans. You've all have seen, I'm sure many of you reported on, the challenge of plastic pollution in the oceans, of overfishing, of ocean acidification, bringing together the leaders in this space, leading scientists, international organizations and businesses. And it was in 2016, Adrian, as I'm sure you'll remember, that uh, we at the forum with some of our partners put the first report out identifying the issue of plastic pollution in the ocean. And since then, this agenda has just taken off. So we're very excited to turn analysis into action. Finally, I'd say that um, across this theme that you've heard from the panel of bringing together the public and the private, of blending the finance, the innovation, 
the entrepreneurialism and the desire to change, to make things better, to shape our future agenda will form a very strong narrative through many of these system initiative themes of food, of energy, of mobility, of the future of production systems, the future of our consumption systems. We even have, in collaboration with the OECD, a sustainable development investment partnership which was launched in 2015. And its goal, with 60 projects already in its pipeline, its goal is to mobilize $100 billion of investment in infrastructure for the global goals by 2020. So we have a lot that's happened over the year. We've got a very exciting week ahead of us. And I have to say that there's a lot of work um, of public-private cooperation ahead of us into 2018. Thank you. Dominic and to all my colleagues, big thank you. I hope that's given you a comprehensive look at all of the uh, many topics and, uh, and participants that we'll be seeing uh, in Davos next week. Uh, we have around 15 minutes left for questions. Uh, if I could just get a sense in the room of uh, who might have a question, uh, just put your hand up if you could for me, and I can then see where we need to direct our microphone. If, uh, with your question, you could also tell us your name and your news organization, that would be fantastic. If we start in the far corner with that gentleman and the gentleman there, that would be fantastic. No, we just need a little bit of volume on your microphone. And we're going to get you another one, almost instantaneously. There we go. Thank you very much. Uh, Tom Miles from Reuters News Agency. Um, Globalisation has made the financial elite who donate to politicians very, very wealthy. Uh, but it's left millions of our workers with nothing but poverty and heartache. So said Donald Trump in 2016. So what makes you think that bringing Trump to Davos, which is surely the home of globalization, if, if nothing else, is going to get him to buy into the Davos doctrine? Do you think you're going to be able to get him to uh, play uh, the team game that you like to play? Thanks very much. Thanks, Tom, for that question. And certainly, uh, you'll see by our logo that we're committed to improving the state of the world rather than to advancing the interests of globalization. And if you recall over the years, our chairman's uh, editorials, in particularly in the 1990s, uh, on exactly this issue when uh, Klaus warned fulsomely of the dangers of unbridled globalization, I think you'll find it's a theme that's frequently been taken up in Davos. But I'll turn perhaps to uh, Borger to uh, just address the, uh, the idea of, uh, of President Trump's participation. So I second what you just said, uh, Adrian, and also as Professor Schwab said that his opening uh, remarks here, uh, very important for us is also no, no uh, to address this with quality um, uh, easing and uh, also with uh, equitable uh, globalization. Um, this uh, is for us. Uh, very important that uh, growth needs to be inclusive, it needs to create jobs, and it needs to be uh, sustainable. And I think uh, participants are really looking forward to also hear the leader of the largest economy in the world, uh, President Trump, share his vision uh, for uh, the global economy uh, moving um, forward. But I think what all we have presented here today shows that we really care about uh, the growth being more inclusive, uh, about skills, about equal opportunities, uh, and we will not be able to address these issues um, in an effective way without having all stakeholders with us. That means also business, governments, and civil society. Morgan, well, thank you. Gentlemen, just the middle. Thank you. Uh, Ye Xiaoyang from China's Tsinghua News Agency. Mm -hmm. uh, my question is uh, to Mr. Uh, Professor Schwab. Uh, Professor Schwab, you uh, just mentioned uh, the historical speech by Chinese President Xi Jinping uh, last year, Davos. And uh, you also have traveled a lot to China. And I think, I believe you probably know China much better than most of the people in the Western world. So my question is, uh, what do you expect from China to contribute to uh, create a, a shared future, especially to 
uh, change and improve this uh, you called uh, fractured world. Thank you. Thanks for that question. That's a, that's a very good point, and it is true, perhaps, uh, that I think Professor Schwab's first visit to China was in 1979 uh, at the invitation of uh, Deng Xiaoping. Can I just get the microphone to Professor Schwab? Up. No, I, I think it's um, next year that we celebrate the 40th time that a Chinese delegation will join us, a high level a governmental delegation will join us in Davos. So we have accompanied China from the beginning of its opening up and reform um, uh, policies. We had the very important, uh, many people would say, historical speech of uh, President Xi. I don't want to repeat what he said. I think we are very fortunate to have um, uh, His Excellency, Mr. Liu He, with us. Uh, we know about his crucial role in uh, uh, shaping uh, the economic policy of China and we expect that he, at a very important moment, because it's after the party congress, will explain to you the next phase of Chinese economic policy. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, I know we've got more questions in the middle and just there. So can we get a microphone, the lady there and the gentleman there. Um, Claudia Knames, Swiss Press Agency. Um, a question to Mr. Schwab. Um, we all know that Donald Trump is going to dominate the topic and we know, all know about him. So I wonder, what is your hope? What the spirit of Davos should do to Donald Trump? That's a very good point. I just want to take the gentleman there as well. Thanks. Yes, uh, Jamil Chad, I'm a journalist from Brazil. My question also to Mr. Schwab. Uh, you're going to have, for the first time in four years, a president of Brazil. Uh, Mr. Temer will be speaking on the same date that President Lula will be judged in Brazil. Uh, so my question to you is, what do you expect to hear from Mr. Temer, and what do you expect from the reforms in Brazil? Thank you. So I'm going to just turn to my colleague, uh, Borga Brenda, to uh, just perhaps take on those questions, because He's participated in the annual meeting, not just as a member of the forum staff, but also as a foreign minister uh, representing Norway. And you perhaps can talk a bit more about the spirit of Davos and what that really uh, means uh, in, uh, from both dimensions, perhaps. Uh, and also, uh, we have an extremely strong Latin American presence, as you mentioned, and part of that presence is President uh, Temer, uh, and perhaps just speak a little bit, given that we will also be in Sao Paulo this year with, uh, with our former Latin America. I think the latter point is also very important. We will then have our uh, first uh, summit after Davos uh, in Latin America, Sao Paulo, uh, in March. We are expecting a great participation from uh, the whole of Latin America. And we know, see also that uh, Brazilian economy uh, is really uh, again, uh, growing. Uh, I think the President Amer will also share his views there uh, on how to make that growth uh, even more inclusive. For me, as, as a former foreign minister, I also had the pleasure of uh, going to Davos as a participant. I, in many ways, uh, feel it is uh, the workshop uh, that's already mentioned. But it's also in many ways the summit of summits beginning of the year because you add on top of uh, the government's uh, business and civil society. And that's the only way to really deal with challenges moving forward. Now, I, I, my view is that I think this also has triggered the great American participation this year. With eight secretaries, eight cabinet members of the US is coming to Davos and staying, most of them, for the whole week. Commerce, Treasury, we will also have Secretary Tillerson uh, on Thursday joining um, uh, President uh, Trump. And um, um, I think Davos uh, um, always has a great impact on all of us uh, when we go there because it's unique, because one has all uh, walks of life represented there. Thank you very much. We have about five minutes left for questions. Can I just get a sense, uh, lady at the back, 
And there's a couple of questions just on that side. Thank you. Uh, Lisa Schlein, Voice of America. Um, I was wondering, dealing with the bookend speaker, so to speak, uh, you have Prime Minister Modi, who is representing the emerging world. He is opening the forum, and uh, President Trump is ending the forum. What themes will they be dealing with? Can you give us a sneak preview of what they will be discussing, whether you expect that their viewpoints will be complementary, or whether they will have uh, pretty divergent views of uh, your, uh, your, our, everyone's so-called fractured world. Thank you. Thank you very much. And if I can just take the two questions just there. Yes, thank you. Alain Franco, RTS Radio. Um, we are all convinced that uh, the spirit Davos, the Davos the spirit, the spirit of Davos is uh, uh, very high and has a big impact on uh, everybody. But did you get any commitment from President Trump that he will play the, the game and answer to this need you were talking about to uh, struggle against uh, uh, this, uh, this world and, and uh, have more cooperation. Thank you, and just a question, finally, your colleague next door. Yes, thank you. Uh, Konrad Sterling from Blick, Switzerland. Uh, obviously, the Swiss public is psyched about Mr. Trump's visit to Switzerland. Can you give us any more details on his trip, well, you said that uh, most of his cabinet members are going to stay for the whole week. When is he going to arrive and when is he going to leave? Well, I think we can start perhaps by sharing the time he'll be speaking on, on Friday, which has now uh, been finalised, which is uh, one point we can share most definitely. I think in terms of sneak previews of speeches, it would be unfair to, uh, to very notable speakers to uh, take any thunder away from their moments on the podium. But uh, we do expect speakers to uh, uh, embrace and recognize uh, the theme of the meeting, which is obviously creating a shared future in a, in a fractured world. But perhaps I can turn uh, again to Bulger and just uh, uh, get your sense on uh, the, some of the details around President Trump's speech. And also just a reminder of the timing on, on Prime Minister Modi's opening. So, of course, uh, Modi and Trump are very important and uh, Modi is opening and, and Trump is doing uh, um, speaking at the closing uh, or almost at the end um, of our annual meeting. But we should not forget that with, uh, we have 70 head of states and governments there. We also on Wednesday have a really important European day. We have the newly uh, elected president of uh, France, uh, Macron, uh, speaking. Uh, Gentiloni will also on Thursday have Secretary General uh, Guterres with us also addressing. And, um, you know, we have G7, a presidency of this year with uh, Trudeau and G20 president, you know, headed by Argentina and President Macri. So I, I think they will be um, complementary to each other, but each of these speakers and leaders, of course, will um, then have their own uh, viewpoint and, and share their insight. And for participants, it's also very interesting to see, uh, like we have seen before, how they position and which challenges uh, they put most emphasis on. And the dialogue that's always there in, dia in Davos is also uh, crucial. So um, we, um, we are very well uh, prepared for this. I think uh, the planning now is for President uh, Trump uh, to speak at uh, 2 o'clock uh, on Friday. I think for Prime Minister Modi, I believe it's 11 uh, o'clock uh, on Tuesday. I'm looking here at my colleague Lee Havel in the front, so I don't make any mistakes on the timing. So I think we're, we're pretty uh, good to go. So for everyone who has registered onto the forum's application, you'll see that our program is being constantly updated. You'll see some new timings come in. I think we've shared with you one of the preliminary uh, programming lists where you'll see all of the uh, sessions that Emma was talking about. Uh, I hope you'll have gotten a sense from my colleagues here uh, and from Professor Schwab just how rich and uh, deep some of the conversations that we'll be having in Davos are and just how important some of the topics to be tackled are. Uh, there'll be opportunities at the end just to have uh, individual 
uh, follow-ups with any of our panelists. In the meantime, thank you very much, and uh, I hope you'll join us in wishing a successful 2018 meeting. So thank you.